Welcome to the CIO Evolution. In this podcast, we'll explore the Chief Information Officer's role in executing a new ongoing leadership imperative, digital transformation that promotes agility and resilience. How do CIOs upgrade legacy networks? What are the financial challenges CIOs face? And what are the security measures that are required in the new work from anywhere mobile and cloud-based world? Chris Jablonski here, Director of CXO Revolutionaries and Community, and your host. Let's back to basics today. As a Zscaler podcast, who better to bring you tales of courageous technology leadership of the sort that causes zero trust projects to succeed? That would be us. We held an Executive Connect Live recently, which is a virtual panel on LinkedIn, and invited two pioneers of zero trust security, Alex Phillips, Chief Information Officer of NOV, and Craig Clay, former lead connectivity architect at Shell and currently a Zscaler CXO advisor. With Kavita Maripan, Executive Vice President, Customer Experience and Transformation at Zscaler moderating, Alex and Craig shared strategies, obstacles, and opportunities on the road to secure digital transformation. Their lessons and insights can help any leader get their zero trust strategy off to a great start or accelerate existing initiatives. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And now on with the program. Alex and Craig, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you both here. So today we're going to talk about infrastructure modernization, but from a different angle. Uh, We know that they always don't need to be, that doesn't always need to be a top-down mandate to succeed to get off the ground. And that results take time and sustained focus. You've both, you know, lived and worked through that. And yet many organizations are often consumed by multiple conflicting priorities and uh, external interrupts that can impede progress. So today we uh, wanted to explore the three basic tenets of successful digital transformation projects, but the three of us have gotten together and talked about, you know, incremental, interoperable, and integrated. So I wanted to dive in, um, you know, let's dive in and get some background behind this. Alex, let's start with you. Um, you've been on a zero trust journey for some time now at NOV, at least, you know, longer than I've been at Zscaler for, you know, I've been here for five and a half years and you've been at it for much longer than that. And have led um, digital transformation at your company, making you know company obviously more agile, adaptable to many of the challenges uh, that and uh, threats that we've seen, um, m- market condition, macroeconomic conditions, um, pandemic, you know, cyber threats, all all of the above. Uh, and as we've talked and spoken in the past, you've mentioned that it was a network engineer who was the first to recommend Zscale at NOV. Can you walk us through that and kind of the lessons that stick out to this day as being some of the most you know, important? Sure, yeah, for us, we didn't even know the word zero trust when we started. Um, we were just trying to figure out how do we deal with this industry downturn? And we knew that we couldn't keep doing what we'd always done. And so I was a, a newly anointed CIO. I was the CISO before that. And I issued a challenge to the team and I said, okay, our traditional vendors may not get us where we need to go. Um, What should we look at? And I had this brilliant network engineer um, who's now my VP of infrastructure. Um, She said, hey, we need to try and check out this company that I've heard of and and let's, let's think a little bit differently. And her incremental thought difference was where we put the security stack. So instead of security stack being on-prem at my data centers, her idea was, why don't we just move the security stack into the cloud? It's guarding us against threats from the internet. So it doesn't really matter if it's, you know, if, if it's on the internet or if it's in our data center. And so that was kind of our first launch into it back in 2016. And, um, you know, since then we've just done tons of different things, but it was that small little incremental change that didn't disrupt really anything other than our edge security appliances, which we fully eliminated. Craig, anything to add to, to what Alex has just said? And I was going to jump in and ask you about, you know, your experience kind of leading Shell's your trust journey. Yeah, I think our, our journey started out with, um, you know, um, in a very much the same way. Um, 
we looked at it, I, I guess there were two, two phases to ours. First was moving to cloud security. And we had a very disruptive event, which was we were about to pull to deploy Office 365. Um, all of our internet pipes were constrained. We had a separate web security stack from our non-web security stack. It was extremely expensive. Budgets were really tight. Um, we didn't have available bandwidth to throw at it um, or, or expense dollars to throw at it. So we, we, we took a look at the problem. We had to look at it in a new way. So on the cloud security front, we had to modernize our security stack. Um, we knew from talking to Microsoft that the express routes that we deployed for Azure was not going to be the appropriate topology for Microsoft 0365. They were heavily recommending internet. They were talking about the fact they would build this giant global backbone that did WAN acceleration on their backbone. The right topology was to localize internet. We were highly centralized. Um, our stack was expensive. So if you took a look at the way we did things with a non-web security stack, a, a web security stack, try to multiply that to localize, to match what IBM was billing for 0365, it simply wasn't going to work. And so we had to look at things a very new way in terms of cloud security. So I think from that standpoint, our journey was very much, um, you know, much like Alex's at NOV. Um, when we talk about zero trust, which, you know, accessing applications, uh, in, internal applications to the outside, that idea definitely came from, you know, our security leadership um, who had read the, the Beyond Trust papers from Google, had talked to, paper, uh, talked to Google, and that's kind of how we got uh, moving in that direction, leveraging the same platform that we'd done for cloud security uh, three years prior. And, you know, when I think about zero trust for apps, mm -hmm. ours was once again, we had an old, you know, VPN appliance solution, and Zscaler, you know, just come out with their uh, private access, and so we said, all right, let's give it a try, and that was 2018. So it was two years after our initial journey was this first big leap into another phase, and uh, it was very incremental, very, you know, uh, coexistent type uh, rollout, and then we fully turned off our old solution. And little did we know that we would be ready for this thing called the pandemic where everybody was going to work from home. Uh, that was, once again, we did not plan for that, but by making these changes and being proactive, it set us up to just be in the perfect spot for those disruptions when they came. And then you wonder why you did the things that you did prior, right? In terms of managing that infrastructure that you had. Um, I do have a question for both of you. I know you talked a lot about, you know, cost um, as well as, um, I mean, cost specifically, right? Um, did you do any ROI analysis, you know, internally to look at kind of what levers that you had that you could potentially pull as an org? We, we definitely did that. Our first driving factor was cost because we we're in the middle of the worst oil and gas downturn, I think, ever. Um, while everyone was enjoying, you know, filling up their vehicles very inexpensively, everyone told us, we don't need your products anymore, Alex. And so dr driving out cost was just fundamental. We had to do it. And we found that the OPEX cost uh, was actually less than the OPEX cost of our old solutions. And we had a number of best in breed old solutions. And that didn't even take into consideration the, uh, the CapEx of replacing mm. all the hardware. And so for us, it was, I mean, literally a, okay, this is gonna save us money, let's do it. Um, it, it was very, very important for us. Uh, it's it's um, important. What about you, Craig? Yeah, for us, uh, you know, we were outsourced at the time, so operations was taken care of by a managed service supplier. Um, any changes we wanted to make to the environment had to be approved, had to become a managed service, or at least had to be you know, contracted at that time. Um, our analysis was um, we had to make um, we had to make readiness for 0365 the highest priority because that was saving an enormous amount of money in the enterprise versus refreshing SharePoint and Outlook and everything else that was on prem, and we had to get out of the way of that project which was already been budgeted for enormous savings. But we were given basically you don't get any of that money your your budget is flat. So what, how, can, how do you do more with less? So we knew our internet pipe right. was totally constrained. Um, what we wanted to do was at a minimum quadruple the available bandwidth to the internet to get to 0365 and keep costs uh, completely flat from an operational perspective. 
understanding that those costs were going to the MFP. So not really quite a full ROI, but that's kind of how we got started and dipped our toe into the water. And then later as we exploited the platform more, we were able to continue to expand um, internet localization and um, bandwidth so that we could you know, continue our SaaS journey because Workday shortly followed ServiceNow, a number of, of yeah. SaaS platforms just kept rolling out. So um, okay. the internet explosion continued for many, many years and probably is till this day. Yeah, and, and we were very similar on Office 365. It was millions of dollars of avoided hardware costs just to build the exchange infrastructure and the SharePoint infrastructure. And of course, OneDrive was something totally new that we were excited about. And when we look at internet localization, when we first rolled out, right, that incremental, we rolled out, we kept our MPLS network and we just utilized our egress points. We had about 17 of those around the world. Well, you know, we're 600 plus facilities at the time. And so as we started our localization journey, it's been millions upon millions of dollars. I think we're over $6 million now in savings and we're still going. Um, you know, there's still areas around the world that had long contracts or they didn't have good direct internet. Uh, but, you know, things have progressed greatly since then. And, and we've done round after round of uh, renegotiation. It always ends up you pay less for internet and you get more. Um, so it's, and, and all that's that kind of iterative process that you don't even recognize you can do it until you've already got the pieces in place. The foundation is there to allow for it. And that was what I really, really appreciated. No, I think you, you, you know, this is a good segue into like my next question, right? You know, you, we always say like, you know, your transformation journey is never done, right? It's a evolving process, right? Um, as, as all factors evolve. Um, and Alex, especially for you right now at NOV, you, you all are in probably the latest stages of your transformation journey per se. I, I would say maybe characterize that as phase number five, um, right? Um, of your zero trust journey, which involves zero trust connectivity for offices. Uh, did you always envisage in terms of like, you know, as you thought about your topology and you planned all of this out and looked at what, you know, business goals you needed to optimize for, um, were five phases kind of the critical phases that you had outlined or were these kind of organic in terms of how they came about? Just for our audience to understand as they embark on this, how do they, how do they chunk this up, right? Yeah, our, our journey was very organic. The first couple were, were very, you know, goals from the beginning. And some of the others were more, hey, maybe we'll be able to do X, Y, Z. Uh, you know, the first one definitely was, how do we get rid of our old legacy stack? We add redundancy, SSL decryption was important to us because at the time when we started in 2015, 50% of our traffic was encrypted and now it's what, 97% of your traffic is encrypted, it's crazy. So SSL encryption was critically important for us. And so we knew about that. Uh, Office 365, uh, we were fully going down the express, the express route. You know, Microsoft said, you got to have these big pipes and all that. And when we were chatting, we were rolling Zscaler out, you guys made it clear to us, no, 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 we know how to optimize the traffic flow. We can help you with that. Don't go down that expensive path, just use direct internet. And so that was, you know, great. But later phases we didn't really have in our plan and that was definitely the internet localization the zero trust access for our internal applications we didn't even think about that and then zero trust for offices with how in the world are you going to deal with security camera time clocks right. um, you know printers from erps all the east west traffic it was like how are we going to deal with that that was not in our plan and then sometimes out of the blue your plans change. And so a year ago, I was presenting to our board and they said, Alex, you've got to double down on data protection. Mm -hmm. uh, this is critically, you know, an important topic for us and you've got to help solve this problem. And so, you know, Zscaler was in my toolkit. And so I was able to start really focusing on, all right, how do I control data? How do I look at data exfil? How do I control the paths? And Zscaler is obviously right in line. Um, and even with an agent, you know, on the devices. So, you know, it's just these phases start adding. And so while phase five is, you know, hey, we're going to take our offices and make them internet islands. 
that one is a long journey. It's going to be complex because you're having to retrain a lot of people in your org that are just used to the, the network always just being there and routing. Everything just works. Well, the problem is the bad guys can use that against us. And so we've got to really control what can and can't work. So I would say we're probably up to seven or eight phases now. <laughs> they just keep growing. Interesting. Um, so I, I wanted to double click on, on, on one thing you, you touched upon, I mean, completely orthogonal, but you touched upon SSL encryption and, and I, you know, for both of you, right. Um, I still find it super fascinating that so many, so many, um, operators out there still do not fully SSL, you know, do SSL encryption, right? Like, you know, what are your thoughts around that oh. and, and any guidance to give folks? Because I know it crosses into this whole notion of privacy, right? And um, there is, there, you know, there is fear. Uh, but I would love both. I know, we've, we, I know we've worked together for years and we, we both, we, all three of us have strong opinions around this, but I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I'll jump in and then Craig, I'd love to hear what you have to say on this. For us, SSL decryption was critical. We saw our machines getting attacked and yet our edge network security stacks were not protecting, they weren't seeing the threats. And it was, they're hiding in SSL traffic. And the bad guys, you know, it's easy for them to do SSL traffic, so they just shift it because they knew a lot of people don't decrypt it. And so we did have some privacy concerns. Germany was a big one, works councils, um, but, you know, I was big on seeing the data and I went to Zscaler and said, hey, I need a feed a raw feed and you guys said, no, sorry, we can't do that, Alex, which the Works Council in Germany loved. Uh, they're like, yay, Alex can't see our traffic. And so having a third party such as Zscaler be the one that does the decrypt, the inspection for evil, the re-encrypt, gave them a lot of confidence that it wasn't the company spying. And me telling them, look, I can't even see it. Uh, yes, I can see where you're going on the internet, but I can't see the actual data itself and it's only for security that we're doing this, it, it gave them a lot of confidence and, and allowed us to, to actually enable it. Craig, what about yourself? Yeah, I think our story is somewhat similar to Alex. So back in late 2015, early 2016, when we were looking at modernizing our web security stack, uh, I wasn't on the security team, but I was on the network team. And one of the things they talked about is we've got to be able to decrypt web traffic. Web traffic is growing much faster than non-web traffic. It's where the exploits are happening. We got to be able to do that. We looked if we could do it in the existing premise boxes. Um, our managed service provider clearly told us, no, they will fall over if you turn that down, turn that on. It's highly uh, process intensive. So that was another kind of key driver into looking at the whole web security stack and seeing how we would do things. We also had a number of discussions about Germany. I think we're probably in a lot of the same countries that Alex is, given we're both in oil and gas. Um, so you do have privacy concerns and, and again, um, you know, the way you mitigated it and the way we did, which is, you know, we can't necessarily see the traffic, um, and specific types of traffic. Maybe we don't decrypt if it's going to specific, um, destinations. Um, we've been able to, you know, use decryption for a number of traffic types. Um, I couldn't enumerate exactly what the specific rules are since my role is more network than security, but the high level strokes are very, very similar to what Alex described as well at Shell. No, I think, I think that's spot on. And I think you know, general guidance to anyone that's getting pushback from legal counsel or workers counsel in general is that there is a very academic explanation to this and that we can work around it, you know, not to accept the some of the concerns around, you know, the the privacy concerns that are, you know, touted these days, you know, there are some real reasonable ways to, for us to have those conversations. So not to take that as a as an absolute no, not to, because I think you place your um, the franchise at risk, you know, ultimately. Um, so let me, Craig, I wanted to kind of double click on one thing. We, we talked about Alex and NOV's journey, you know, multi-phase journey, and Alex is, you know, he's in phase seven, eight, you know, kind of characterized um from your perspective kind of how does that incrementally you know fit with you and what your work at shell and do you believe like focusing on a single use case can help establish value internally win champions you know see the win and you know for understanding you know 
DTNA across technology and network architecture teams, and then the progress from that in terms of how one would, you know, steps one, and what were the steps you took, right, in terms of winning over your champions internally to um, to make progress? Yeah, um, if you kind of look at a zero trust journey, it's uh, kind of daunting if you try to, you know, basically boil the entire ocean for starters. So um, I'll, I'll touch on this, if you don't mind, kind of in two different initiatives. One is how we rolled out cloud security, because that was incremental, and also what we did on the zero touch side. Um, so in cloud security, I mentioned we had a very large stack, both on the non-web and the web side. And so when we first rolled out Zscaler, we were under enormous pressure. We had um, the Microsoft 365 rollout coming. Uh, at the end of the day, we had about six to 12 weeks to plan and six weeks to implement. Um, across the entire corporation, cloud security. It was uh, a bit frightening, quite honest, because a few of us like myself felt like our careers were on the line because we bet the, we bet the ranch on this. And we said, no, we don't need premise proxies. We're going to be able to not spend that money. We need to reallocate that money towards bandwidth and we're going to go in with cloud security and, and premise proxies are gone and we're going to get rid of our current cloud uh, security service that we use for internet content filtering. So, you know, the first six to 12 weeks was just the nitty gritty stuff of, okay, well, let's look at these proxies. Let's see what rules we have in there. We found out we had 2000 bypass rules. Oh, we wow. can't put that in a pack file. So we started looking at why do we have these? And it was due to slowdowns that we were having in the cloud security platform. So most of the destinations who were set to bypass the cloud security platform um, were just simply in there because somebody opened a trouble ticket. Nobody went through any approval process and essentially it was bypassed. So we were having over time less and less traffic actually going through our, our security services, which was a very bad thing. So the benefit was we were actually cleaning things up as we went. At the end of the day, we found uh, about 20 sites that had an allow list. These were typically third party ASPs that had an allow list for a specific address range that came from Shell. And so at the end of the day, that's all we needed to put in the pack file to replace this gigantic rule set that we had in the proxies. And the proxies weren't doing any SSL inspection because mm -hmm. we enabled that, it would fall over. If we increase the bandwidth of the internet pipe, it would fall over. So, um, so the first phase was basically replacing um, the cloud security platform that we had and the premise proxy, none of the rest of the stack, none of the non-web stack initially. Mm -hmm. but that was a lot to bite off uh, in, in yeah. the first go. And that was actually kind of a bigger bite than I would have liked to take, but it went really well. So we did basically, you know, Asia one weekend, the next weekend we did all of Europe, Middle East and Africa. The next week we did the U S then we had a separate trading tenant uh, that we did the next three weeks, uh, same thing, three regions around the globe. And then we kind of took a breather. Um, we let the operations team really dig in and, um, you know, they, they'd already been doing testing, but really understand the platform. And then we start looking at moving, removing other aspects of the stack. Some of those were opportunistic when the service would expire. For instance, we had botnet appliances. Those things went next. IPS went later. Mm -hmm. uh, we started looking at what other use case we can use it for. Well, our bit site score was bad on guest wireless. So that was the next thing we attached. We started. Uh, basically protecting uh, guest wireless users and, and then later road warriors. And so that incremental approach is what we used. Um, with zero trust, it was a single use case and a single set of users. And there we started with IT. Um, that was a lo lot more difficult because we're integrating identity access management and device trust into decisions on whether to allow access. It's like, this is a little more difficult. Let's start with a really small user group and one device type, and let's learn from there. And we sat in that you know, group for a while. So if you can use IT to uh, basically get the bugs out before it rolls out to the business, it's always great if you can do that. Not always the case, but that's what we always try to do. And I see Alex nodding, so I suspect oh, yeah. his Please. environment as well. Well, especially when it came to zero trust, you know, one of the lessons learned is we did IT and we found out that our EMC filers, we couldn't access them. And we had no clue why. And um, a lot of back and forth with Zscaler engineers trying to figure it out. I think we got called a science experiment at one point. Uh, we're trying to figure this out. And it turned out they had integrated DNS services built into them. And of oh. course, everything about zero trust using you know, Zscaler private access is DNS based for us. Uh, we don't allow IP, you know, direct IP communication, no ping. You know, we, 
we really lock it down to where everything's got to have DNS. And and IT being that uh, guinea pig, drinking our own champagne, we like to say, uh, is the best way to find just the weird, weird oddities and to learn to create workarounds for specific use cases. Um, there were a few use cases for our network team that ZPA wasn't the best solution. And so we told them, okay, well, you're going to need a jump host, a secure jump host inside of our environment. You get to the secure jump host via ZPA, so it's a zero trust connection. And then from there, you can, you know, administrate your networking. You're uh, it in lateral. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so, Alex, um, that takes us very nicely into the next you know, topic, which is interoperability. I think Craig set us up real well, right? As he was talking about how they were grappling with identity and, and all of that. And, um, so what does your stack look like right now at NOV? And then, you know, what kind of, what type of factors went into you deciding whether or not to choose best of breed solutions, right? Best of breed is timely. So what is best of breed and how do you future proof that while you're in, on this on this journey of sort of reducing technical debt and, and modernizing your IT? Yeah, when we started, it was really focused on driving out cost. And Zscaler was mature enough that you could interoperate with all of our legacy things. Um, you know, there's certain protocols on the um, IoT side, you know, like Profinet or, or some of those things with control systems that we just had to handle a little bit differently. Um, but when it came to our legacy systems, Zscaler really fit very well into that stack. And then as trouble came up or as uh, things we were trying to solve, we would work closely with Zscaler to figure out, okay, how can we solve this? Do you have something or do you not? We were looking at best of breed before we adopted Zscaler, but then we slowly moved to more of a platform approach. Um, and we've gone more and more that direction, except where things, obviously you guys, you know, did not have a solution. One of the challenges we had with our data protection journey was around USB drives. And um, if you could see the custom USB drive little collection I have, uh, we must have a hundred different USB drives that, you know, we give away and they're in the shapes of all of our little products that we make. But it was, it was so ingrained that we use USB that I, I needed to be able for everyone to share USB. Zscaler didn't have a good solution for that. And so I had to find a third party to handle that. And it, it works fine with Zscaler. Um, you know, there's a lot of software asset management, machine management. That's not Zscaler's specialty, but it, it coexists fine. Um, identity is a critical piece for us. We use our old legacy um, ADFS when we first started with Zscaler. Since then, we've upgraded. We're now an Okta customer. Zscaler worked great with both. Actually, Okta enabled us to do a lot more advanced things that we weren't able to do with our old legacy stack. And so that is one of the things that Zscaler has been a great partner of ours when it comes to is how do you work with various things and how do you interoperate all these, these stacks? Because there is no such thing as just one platform, um, especially when you've got a large complex organization. You're always going to have a lot of platforms. And if you've been around a number of years, you've got a lot of legacy platforms. And uh, we've been, you know, 100 plus years in business and we have a ton of legacy. So uh, it's uh, it's always fun trying to protect those as new threats come about. And, uh, you know, just understanding the scope and breadth sometimes can be a challenge. No, I think it's really important to think about this from an ecosystem perspective, right? And I think the, the higher the degree of interoperability, the better or you know, the more sophisticated, the bi-directional threat hunting capabilities as well, right? I mean, as we think about endpoint and and you know all of those, um, I wanted to also double click on, on one thing that both of you touched upon, and you've been customers and partners for a really long time, and it's just totally off the playbook here, but um, you've pushed us to build and to develop and to harden our solutions and our platform you know, over the years, right? How, how is it that you've worked with you know, your vendors to do that? I think it's, you know, it's, it's an important topic. I think when, when, you, when you get into something as, as critical as this, as mission critical as this, it's important to be working with best of breed players and 
to be influencing that roadmap, right? And you know, I'd love to hear just your, you know, anecdotally, like how have you both done that? Um, because I know you've contributed tremendously to helping us kind of navigate, and drive, and harden our platform and our feature set. So, I mean, Craig, maybe if you want to take yeah, that. I, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So, you know, I, during my time at Shell, I was on a number of different advisory boards. Um, some advisory boards were more uh, with with various vendors and various suppliers. Um, generally, I find those are extremely uh, effective ways because you're you've actually got extended time in front of executives that are building product to help influence roadmap. So uh, for me, I, I use those as huge opportunities to expand on what I thought was a problem that needed to be addressed and really try to champion that cause and also work with others in the room, many of whom had the same problems. So, uh, you know, there are folks in the room from BP, folks in the room from NOV, folks in the room from a number of different companies. and. And we had a lot of similar challenges. Um, and so I, I found uh, Zscaler was great at listening to customer requirements and going after it. There are a few times we were pushing and there wasn't a, a solution right away and we were able to you know, switch later. So you know, I mentioned we used pack files to, to solve our problem way back in 2016 where it required a shell IP address. So that was fixed later with IP anchoring, source IP anchoring. Yeah. Um, that, that, that was one. Um, the integration that you do with Microsoft and actually building uh, your Zen nodes directly you know, near Microsoft really helped our performance. And that alliance we see all the, all the time. Um, ZDX, we, we talked that over um, as a requirement. If we're going to go to direct internet access and we're no longer hairpinning traffic through our application performance monitoring stack in our data mm -hmm. centers, the only thing that can see that traffic measure performance is the proxy that sets in the cloud that's talking to APIs on the endpoint, seeing what's going on at the endpoint um, and the endpoint software that resides on there, and also seeing what's going on in the cloud, what's going on with Zoom, what's going on with Microsoft. It's the only place where that information can be uh, obtained. And so, you know, ZDX, I believe, was a very much a customer requirement. Um, I know I was one of the champions of that, and it's been an incredibly helpful advance uh, for being able to have a, a, a viable application performance monitoring stack when, when you're in a direct uh, internet access or zero trust mode. And uh, so um, really having suppliers that listen to customer requirements is key, and Zscaler has delivered time and time again for that. Yeah, to, to add on to what Craig said, I'm going to give you a couple of hacks. So a number one hack, find that person inside the company that gets excited by technology and then just spend as much time as you can with them because you're sharing all your needs and they get excited and they're like, oh, yeah, we should be able to do that. Uh, the second hack is that when Zscaler gives you an API, make sure you use it. Um, mm -hmm. we, early on, we had a challenge with foreign language websites and categorizations. You guys have since totally fixed that. But we have people in 60 plus countries speaking, you know, 20 plus languages and English was handled really, really well. But some of the other languages weren't. And so, you know, we're like, hey, all these language, all these sites and we would give you these massive dumps of all these sites that, you know, shouldn't be blocked or should be categorized differently. And at one point, I think we over spammed your API. And so they, you guys started ignoring what we were sending. So it was calls. too many API yeah. calls. <laughs> but you know, you work with vendors and partners to help them, right? You're saying, "Look, help me to help you, so that you can help me." And um, you know, it's funny when I do advisory calls now because you know, we, if we had to do it again, we would definitely pick Zscaler. And so we love to help our partners, and we've used Zscaler as a partner. Um, when I do advisory calls and they're like, okay, what are some of the challenges you had implementing? I'm like, well, it was a long time ago and all those things that we fought hard on, they're fixed now. And it was part of Zscaler listening to the feedback and saying, you've got to fix this. This was painful. There's got to be a better way. Um, and, if, and if you don't have a vendor that does that, you need to find a different vendor. And um, so that's one of the huge things that we love about Zscaler is you listen to our feedback. And sometimes when you tell us no, you tell us the reason behind the no. And I've always found that anytime I need to get something done, if I can explain the why, I get a lot more buy-in. 
Um, and so I use that inside my company as well. Now, we, we obviously thank you for the partnership. I didn't mean for you know the, the discussion to be like, hey, Zscale is great. But, but I did want to bring that up simply because I think design partnership is so critical as companies evolve and we evolve together, right? Um, and so much of you know, the genesis of, of, of our platform really is through this type of like tight design partnership relationships that we've had with many of you and there's there's much more to come i mean i still as i meet with customers every week you know i hear you know many of our longtime customers say like you know kavita this i'm going to tell you this is you know this doesn't work but this works so you know you guys need to keep your eyes open for this or you know and that we are humbled by that right it's important and and that's how we learn um well, and i'll just give one quick horror story when we first rolled out zpa it was a 1.0 product and it was difficult to monitor the connectors inside of our inside of our network. And so if we had, you know, 20 connectors scattered around the globe to provide, you know, the best access for our users, if one of them wasn't working well or had an issue, you couldn't really tell. Well, as you guys develop ZDX around performance monitoring, you use that same technology to improve your monitoring inside of our network for those connectors. And so it was a way that you solved a pain point for me um, by also helping, you know, offer a product that you could then use to improve your other existing products. And, you know, today we don't have that pain point. Um, you know, the connectors, if there's an issue, we, we have a way to see it. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit to our favorite topic of VPN. Um, favorite collective topic of VPN. So now I understand like large organizations can't just simply switch overnight from legacy technology to zero trust access. And if this is, you know, as much as people think it's a rip and replace, you all know that's not. So we talk about VPN coexistence and, but obviously, you know, dis, you know moving that away from your crown jewel apps, um, as long as that's necessary during a zero trust transformation um, journey. Can you explain kind of this this notion of VPN coexistence in the in the interim, the risks associated, and and kind of how y'all went about doing this? Either one of you. Um, yeah, you want to go first, Alex, or I, it's up to you. But I, I really do distinguish kind of the difference between VPN, whether it's site to site VPNs or users connecting to a VPN. Um, are you thinking site to site? Let's or, start with site to site. Yeah. Site to site's the hard one, right. right? Because everybody's used to just having a network to where routes route anywhere right. you want to go. And so this is the one that is my phase five that we're working on. And interoperability is absolutely critical on this because you can't do it overnight. You've got to do site by site and you've got to figure out and make all the specific routes and rules in a zero trust manner for objects that don't understand identity. Anything that understands identity, site to site, zero trust is no problem. But things that don't have an identity, things that can't use identity, those are your challenges and your complexity. And so, you know, typical, we've all used IPsec. And we create these big end-to-end -end IPsec tunnels and traffic just routes over them, no problem. And so having those in existence while you're slowly moving, that everything's still got to work, right? The users while you can change things everything still must work and um, so that that's really the complex part mm -hmm. and the part that you know we're working through today figuring out all those things um and then of course when you go user vpn um that's much much easier you guys saw that a long time ago and uh, we did implement that in a weekend and so but there are a lot of planning ahead on that one uh craig I mean, what about you yeah no craig go on yeah, for us on the on the user side, I guess there's two aspects of coexistence. So, you know, when we rolled out ZPA initially on our enterprise desktops, we didn't really ratchet down access. We had a zero trust platform in Zscaler, but candidly, we we're still figuring out the business rules, which groups are allowed to access which applications on which devices. And that's kind of hard work that involves the businesses that own those applications. But that also made it easy to implement because uh, the first thing you have to have is a platform that's capable of zero trust. And that's not what we had. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very important first step. And then the only applications we found that didn't work were these, you know, strange, thick applications. Alex talks about this legacy. We're a hundred year old company as well. 
we'd have some legacy application with 50 users lump at a thick application that went to a fixed IP address as a destination. So those would stay on VPN until we could remediate the application or replace the application or move to Citrix, which later can now move to browser isolation. Um, another example of, of a, a service that's been added on since we, we initially deployed. So that was kind of our, you know, our journey of coexistence with VPN. Um, obviously, the, the long term plan is not have VPN side by side the, de uh, the zero trust agent on the desktop, but it is a journey to get there. Um, I also agree with Alex on the sites. Um, you know, user can be challenged for multi-factor authentication. When you're talking about things at a site, it's a whole different animal. And there it's probably gonna require an ecosystem approach. If it's a Wi-Fi device, you probably have things like um, radius services out there or that can actually do um, some uh, look at what the traffic type is and probably determine, okay, this is an IP camera. It probably only needs to really talk to one destination. Let me figure out that destination's on-prem or in the cloud. And so, just like there's an ecosystem today on the user side between, say, Ping or Okta and Zscaler to, to make those zero trust decisions, it's likely going to have to be a similar thing with something like a, an AirWatch, um, you know, working with Zscaler to figure out what a device is allowed to talk to and what that device is. So um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that progresses over time with zero trust sites. That's going to be a very exciting journey. It's going to be, uh, you know, I think we're all going to learn a lot on how best to approach that problem. Oh, that's awesome. Alex, um, we talked a little bit about managing devices. And obviously, you, you know, both of your, you know, organizations, um, you know, you have hundreds of branch offices, factories, and you're dealing with OT systems as well. Um, I'd like to sort of, you know, touch upon how do you, you know, deal with secure access and connectivity across all of these, you know, data centers included, and what challenges still remain you know, as, as you have kind of this target, you know, architecture in mind of what the end game needs to be. Yeah. I mean, to, to, you know, our early remediation is still in place. So when we first rolled out in 2016, it was all GRE tunnels yeah. from our facility to the cloud. The nice thing about that is all traffic. It doesn't matter if it's IOT, if IOT is trying to go to the internet, if a printer, if a copier, it goes through the GRE tunnel and so it's protected. Um, as we moved more and more to identity-based protection with an, with an agent, right, the Zscaler agent on the endpoint, it enabled them to be outside of our network and still protected, but you still have all these legacy devices that are left behind. Uh, some of the work that we've uh, worked with your engineering teams on is around, you know, a TV that's internet connected mm -hmm. and all of them are now, should only have traffic going to certain sites. I mean, it behavior of that is very static. A time clock, very static. A printer, very static. And Zscaler building a way to detect when changes happen, right? You guys integrating in with IPAM solutions so you understand devices better and being able to profile devices automatically. Um, things like that are huge as we move forward and we think about our networks and what's worked in the past and what's working in the future. Um, because some of the zero trust rules that we're going to create are a little bit of a cheat. We're mm -hmm. creating trust. And anytime we see that trust violated, we need to know and take action upon it. And, you know, as Craig said, hey, where does this need to communicate? Is it inside? Is it outside? And it should always be that way. And anytime you see a change, it's no longer that device. It's something else. So really what I've thought about in some of our sessions that we work together with, really your traffic pattern is your identity. A mm -hmm. time clock doesn't have identity built into it. It can't multi-factor, but its traffic pattern is its identity. So it's really going back to behavior based. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's kind of the critical piece to the security stack as we move forward is monitoring and seeing what that behavior is. It's one a traversal, right? That's really interesting perspective to take. Craig, did you have anything you wanted to add to that as well? Yeah, in, in the short run, I think we've got, we saw three different real traffic patterns. We saw lots and lots of devices and processes being monitored by say GE that was set on the internet. So, you know, it, was, it may have been 
uh, an IoT sensor, but it was definitely not in the, embedded deep in the Purdue model. Um, we had uh, we had other assets that were very much embedded in the Purdue model and probably will be for a number of years because they've got to be very hardened from the outside. And then we had the third use case, which was really interesting, which was privileged remote access uh, into those systems, those process control systems. That was a you know a big exposure point. And for many years, we were building our own bespoke solutions because there weren't industry solutions to that problem. So that's probably the one that's you know needs to be tackled the most. The IoT problem where the sensors are talking to you know one data lake somewhere or talking to one specific vendor. Again, as Alex mentioned, if we can do that with uh, the identity of the device or or somehow taking a look at what it is uh, from a, a MAC address standpoint, an IPAM standpoint, where it's supposed to talk to, securing it that way is important. And then the the legacy pull of you know, Purdue model, you know, L1, L2 stuff is going to be a number of years before that ever really kind of comes to the fore is, is moving further out into a real zero trust model. Well, gentlemen, we're um, we're coming to the end of our session. I think we can do this for another hour and, you know, still have tons of fun. Um, but I wanted as, as sort of parting comments, um, you know, we, we obviously pull some takeaways together, but do, do you know, for both of you, Parting words of wisdom for those who are, you know, embarking on their journey, partway through their journey, potentially to towards kind of the latter stages of their transformation journey. Uh, you know, what uh, words of advice would you give, um, Alex? Perhaps we'll we'll start with you. Yeah. So for me, it's never boil the ocean. Um, you've got to break it into small chunks. Get quick wins. Those small chunks drive towards that. Um, explain the why. The why is critically important. You're going to be asking things to change. And if you can explain the why, you can get buy-in. Um, those are my critical ones. I could go on and on about, you know, the team. How do you deal with resistance? Uh, that's a whole other session there. But, you know, explaining that why helps eliminate a lot of those challenges. Break off those small chunks. Get some quick wins. It builds confidence that you've made the right choice. And um, don't be afraid to explore. Um, don't be afraid to explore, try things. And I always say, always have a close relationship with your partner that you've chosen and make sure you provide that feedback to them on what worked great and what did not. It, those are critical feedback loops. Thank you, Alex. Craig? Yeah, for me, what I would add to what Alex said, and I agree with everything he did say is, you know, for us, we had to work together as an architecture team more with Zero Trust than we probably had previously, uh, because it is really a team sport with different suppliers in different domains, identity access management, device operations, hosting, working together, making sure the supplier ecosystem works together, um, think through these problems in, in a, in a long-term way, and then give yourself time to achieve that. So, you know, create a five-year roadmap to get there, look for an incremental approach to get small wins along the way. And your organization, your operations teams need time to learn. And so the, each of these incremental steps builds confidence in the journey, um, helps you learn how to leverage the platform to solve problems that are adjacent to it uh, to help move forward. So that, that would be what I would add to Alex's comments. Thank you both so much, um, not just for today, but obviously for, you know, for working with us, for partnering with us, guiding us and, and, you know, pushing us. Thanks for listening to the CIO Evolution. Check back with your podcast provider regularly for more episodes. You can find more episodes along with other podcasts on the CXO Revolutionaries website at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Statements by Zscaler podcasters and guests are informational only and should never be construed as legal advice. You should consult your legal advisor on matters related to you or your business. Zscaler makes no warranties, express, implied, or statutory as to the content of this podcast, and it is provided as is. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of the recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2021.